Hi y'all, and welcome back to another episode of Stories of the Rails. Today, I bring you to the east coast of the United States and into the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachians are one of the most biologically diverse areas in North America, containing an array of forest types, including oak and hickory forests, sycamore and spruce fir stands at high elevations, and pine forests, all ripe for lumber, fuel, and building materials. We first started pulling lumber out of these mountains using just man and animal power until the age of steam came along and dramatically changed the logging industry. Maybe for the worst. And it left many hollows and mountain ranges barren, stripped of their trees and cover that once stood for ages. The logging railroad era in the Appalachian Mountains has been well documented over the years by many historians and through their respective books, local historian buffs, rail fans, and backcountry hikers who often walk the former rail beds have enjoyed reading of this colorful age when timber barons sent whole armies of men into the woods to harvest the vast, untouched forests of the region. If you've ever backpacked in the Appalachian Mountains, there's one fact that becomes quickly evident. Virtually every hollow, every stream, and every mountain has a railroad grade. In some places, the railroad ties are still on the ground. In others, visitors might run across a rusting wash tub in the middle of the woods, or even an occasional railroad spike or rail. But regardless how far back you go or how deep into the wilderness, the grades are there, a testament to the energy of man, power of the dollar, and the complete destruction of forest ecosystems. Back in November of 1770, George Washington was exploring the Valley of Kanawha and was one of the first to document a description of the trees in this wild, uncharted land. On November 4, 1770, while traveling along the Kanawha River, he wrote in his journal, Just as we came to the hills, we met with a sycamore of a most extraordinary size. Measuring three feet from the ground, it was forty-five feet round, lacking two inches. And not fifty yards from it was another, 31 feet round. I could not possibly envision walking through miles and miles of spruce, sycamore, popular forests with trees growing to sizes difficult to comprehend. What would it have been like to camp in these hollows and flats filled with massive trees and extensive laurel and rhododendron thickets, where in places the cover was so thick that sunlight never reached the ground? What would I have felt standing next to a poplar tree soaring 140 feet in the air? I can only imagine. By the evidence in these writings, lumberjacks and logging railroaders were a hardy bunch who were pushed to the max each and every winter. The perils of working in the woods or on these remote backwoods rail lines were plentiful, and no doubt many accidents of note took place, probably on a regular basis. Unfortunately, Some of these incidents had tragic results. One such occurrence, which took place 134 years ago last month, on January 31, 1890, was the fatal crash of the logging locomotive Triton, which was being used on a temporary basis on the Kilkenny Lumber Company Railroad Line between Lancaster and Willard Basin on the west side of the Pilot Range Mountains in the northern White Mountains. The engine pressed into service a day earlier after the line's regular log-hauling locomotive, the Mount Washington, was put out of service by a blown cylinder head. The Triton was only a year old, but up to then had been used primarily for shunting cars in and around the yards of Concord and the Montreal Railroad. It was no match, it turned out, for the larger, more dependable Mount Washington. With engineer... Leonard Crouch at the helm, Triton was pulling a string of about a dozen cars loaded with upwards of 60,000 board feet of logs, when a coupling pin between two of the cars snapped, sending the engine and the front cars careening down the steep, crooked rail line running out of Willard Basin. It was a frightening scene, best described by author Bill Gove. With the handbrake set, Crouch began the steep descent at a speed of 10 to 15 miles per hour. 
the most that could be expected on a course that dropped 800 feet in 3 miles, averaging 5% in grade. After passing Button's Landing, the train reached a sag in the grade, and Crouch gave the load a little power boost to carry it up and over the rise at the end of the sag. There was a sudden strain on the Lincoln pin couplers as the load shifted from gravity momentum to engine pull, and the coupler links clanked against the pins, straining it apart. The sudden wrench was too much for one of the pins, the one linking the fourth and fifth car log cars, and it sheared through, dropping from place. The train parted, dropping off eight log cars and the caboose, and disaster began to ride the rails. Death was riding an iron horse. The Triton, with its reduced load of four cars, passed on through the orchard and pitched over the rise. By now, Len Crouch was painfully aware of what had happened to his consist, and was acutely attentive to the danger that now lie immediately ahead of him. The train speed increased to 25 or 30 miles an hour as he sped down through Hartford's woods. The increased speed due in part to the loss of the nine cars with brakes set tight to hold him back. Crouch had air brakes on the locomotive and tender, but now he dared not use them for fear of lifting the tender from the crooked track at what now was a hurling descent. Although he couldn't see behind him, he supposed the parted section might be close on his heels and a rear end boost would be fatal at this tense moment. He wanted the break, but feared to. Unseen and immeasurable dangers were hurtling toward both ends of this nearly runaway train, or so it seemed. White knuckles gripped the throttle as Len Crouch peered through the pelting rain. He was now about a quarter mile below the last hilltop. The reverse curves were coming on him fast, and the two ribbons of steel could barely contain the swaying triton. It was too late now to even think of braking. He could only hope by some sort of miracle the careening locomotive would stay on the rails. But the worst was yet ahead, and with eyes almost pinched shut against the wind and rain, Crouch suddenly saw the first sharp curve coming toward him with blinding speed. Jump! he hollered to Fireman Balch, who climbed up into the window and leaped towards the bank speeding by just before the front wheels touched the beginning of the curve. When the Triton hit the curve, it never slowed a bit, nor did it deviate much from a straight line. With a horrendous crunch, 32 tons of hurtling metal slammed into the frozen bank, fringing the lower side of the reverse curve. The light tender and four log cars lifted from the tracks and propelled through the air, catapulting on top of and even beyond the steaming wreckage wherein lie trapped Len Crouch. The binder chains quickly broke, and twenty-foot-long spruce logs came hurtling down, ramming and rolling over the still mobile wreckage. Some of the debris landed on Fireman Balch, where he lay stunned after rolling along the ground. But the fatal punch came as one spruce log smashed through the cab wreckage and pinned the petrified Len Crouch against the hot boiler, followed by another spruce missile which split open and sheared off part of his head. Death had claimed a quick victim. Within seconds, all was quiet through Hartford's woods. All, that is, except for the eerie wail and Triton's whistle. It had become stuck open at the crash and continued to proclaim the calamity until all the boiler's steam was spent. Within a few minutes, the other eight log cars came slowly rolling down the track. Not hot on the heels of the speeding train heading for calamity, but poking along at three to four miles an hour with brakes set tight. The horror of the scene stunned the men as they ran forward from the saloon car. Balch was pulled out from the, under the jackstrawed logs, alive but badly hurt. But for Crouch, it had been his last trip. Fortunately, the Triton's one and only run into the Kilkenny Woods was the lone major crash in the decades-long history of this particular logging railroad. But that's not to say there weren't others in and around the Appalachian Mountains. But there certainly were. We'll save those for another day. I'd like to thank you all for being here with me today, and I hope you enjoyed this story of the wreck of the Triton. My channel has reached over 900 subscribers now, 
and it's all thanks to each and every one of you. Soon we'll be at that 1k mark, and I can't thank you all enough. But until next time, y'all, be safe, and God bless.